Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi, you guys. So there's no beer in this coffee cup, which is making me a little sad because I think I'm the only person in here who hasn't had a beer, including Paul. That was a big <laughs> hint. <laughs> can, I get, can I get something out of the way? It's yes. really, really incredibly annoying to me. Whenever I'm, it, it, you know, I won another James Beard Award in, I think, 2014. Oh, we and it was, to it was rigged that. because I tied David Chang for Outstanding Chef in America. Like, how does that happen? Do you think if I actually won and David Chang was like two votes behind, that they would have been like, okay, it's a tie? It's something like that. Anyways, I'm very proud of the fact that I won that award. You know, Best Chef in the Midwest, it's good. Yes. Outstanding Chef in America is much more exciting, but. Even better. For some reason, I'm low-key, and I don't brag about stuff, but I just, I'm pissed off, and I felt the need <laughs> to make sure that you guys knew that I did win that award. You know, it's all about everyone else nowadays that works for me, not so much about me, but... Right. All right. Which is, we're going to, yes, so maybe we should give them another round of applause. Yeah, please, you guys. Thank you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> Um, so, I, I also want to warn you that you're probably going to get very hungry during this program, so just... Uh, right to the chicken. Yeah, right to the chicken, publican chicken. This is the most famous publican chicken, if there is such a thing. Or publican res recipe. Right? Yeah. Yes. Um, what do you want to know about it? I want to know everything. Well, first of all, it's inspired by Montreal, which was kind of exciting yeah. for me to discover. I lived in Montreal for a long time. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when we were getting ready to open the publican, our third restaurant, Blackbird was first, Avec. Um, was second. Um, you know, the, the, the pressure was on. What are you guys going to do next? We love your restaurants. They're so special. And somehow I glommed down to the soundbite, oysters, pork, and beer. Um, and I would go to events around the country with my chef buddies, and they'd be like, hey, what are you working on? You know, everyone talks it up, and I'd say, well, we're, we're going we're gonna to open a restaurant that's all about oysters, pork, and beer. And they'd say, sounds awesome. Go for it, dude. Like, nobody said, no, that sounds horrible, That's forget terrible it. terrible idea. And we were, we were kind of dancing around the whole gastropub phenomenon that was going on um, in Europe and just starting to come to the United States. And I also had this vision in my mind of the publican being sort of, uh, I've, I've, called it, uh, I've called it a family restaurant on LSD, which, you know, whatever, take that as you will. But just a, a, a very different take on a family restaurant, kind of harking back to a time where people ate differently. Um, and I thought all the standbys needed to be um, really special and mm -hmm. you know the menu it's a, it's a long story we'll get into it uh, why I think the book is different than most cookbooks mm -hmm. um, but the recipes that stick you know the menu changes based on product that comes in the back door every day um, so on, in any given week five days you'll have a lot of different dishes right. on the menu the public right. can, but the chicken is one that never changes but you said um, beer pork and oysters and yeah chicken isn't any yeah. of those things. So. <laughs> yeah. All right, I can't answer that question, but um, <laughs> uh, but but it, it was one of the touch points. You know, we have um, pork country ribs, a very different cut of pork mm -hmm. uh, that a cook that I used to work with would bring to a barbecue that I threw every summer, and uh, they were they were just recipes that I knew were delicious that we worked really hard on, um, and that one was based on a trip to Montreal where uh, my partner Donnie and I uh, bellied up to a Portuguese. Uh, we we went to a Portuguese chicken shack and sat at the counter and. Um, had the chicken, it was, uh, they cooked french fries in a pressure cooker, um, like a weird machine that I've never seen before, and then they grilled this chicken, and it was a guy smoking a cigarette with like 20 chickens on the grill in front of him, and he chopped it up. Special and he, seasoning. Special seasoning. Ashes. And he, he put the chicken on top, and you know, the juice bled into the french fries. The, the, oh, thanks, you guys. Oh, yay! Can I have a whiskey, just, too, can please? Can I just give a shout-out to CHF <laughs> staff, who are the best people in the world? Right, please. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, Thank you, Patrick. But, but anyways, uh, it was just a memory that stuck with me. And, I, of course, I said to the, the gentleman, what, what, what spices are in this? And he said, you know, the, the, the standard yes. line, if I told you, I'd have to kill you. Right. Um, but at any rate, when I got home and started working on the publican, um, tried every combination and permutation under the sun, and I think the, the secret ingredient, it's not so secret anymore, is espalette pepper, uh, the wonderful Basque chili pepper that's super complex, and it's sort of uh, that and, and uh, Judy Rogers' wisdom, you know, pre-salting chickens, and the, the first chef, the, the young man that I worked on that, he's not so young anymore, but the gentleman that I worked on that recipe so hard with, Brian Houston, um, worked for Judy Rogers, and so he's like, yeah, we got to pre-salt the chicken, and it 
Um, you know, we tried 10 different birds from 10 different farmers. Um, we pre-salted. We didn't pre-salt. We used espalette pepper. We used paprika. We just tried everything until we uh, got something that we thought was great. Well, it is Ooh. delicious. Has anyone had the publican <laughs> chicken? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If you haven't, you should go out and have it. But, like, what a beautiful thing that you get to feed people. Um, and there are a lot of stories about how you learn to do that or who helps you feed them. But can you just tell us your story? Like, how did you get into the business of feeding people in the first place? Um, well, I, I think it goes back to a, a story. Um, it, it's, it's really... The interview is going to be over. I'm just going to answer this question, and you guys can leave, and it's over. But um, it's it's a lot of things. My uh, uh, my dad, uh, I grew up, he had a delicatessen on Devon Avenue in Chicago called Fans Fishery in the 60s, and I have memories of being behind the counter, standing on these wood planks, jabbing... Uh, you know, jamming pieces of, you know, corned beef scrap in my mouth and candy and pickles and just, I, I was a terror. Um, but but years later, he opened up a little uh, smoked fish shack in Rogers Park called the Village Fishery. And uh, when I was a, a little kid, uh, I would work there. And that, that work was taking uh, smoked fish out of the brine and putting it on, uh, putting it on racks and then helping my dad wheel it into the smokehouse. And the next day when we would get back to work, He'd open the door, and it was an old-fashioned smokehouse. Literally, he'd put straw in there and light it on fire, close the door. It would suffocate, and the fish would smolder all night. And they were silver when you put them in, and the next day you'd come back, and they were this amazing golden color. Mm -hmm. And my dad, who uh, uh, isn't with us anymore, but he, re he resembled a street man. He had a really long beard, different colors, long hair. He was a really handsome dude. Um, <laughs> imagine me with a really long five-colored beard, long hair. But uh, my dad pulled the rack out, and he, he tore the head off a big smoke fish and pulled the skin back and sort of shoveled the, the warm, uh, it was a chub, a smoke chub, which used to be, the Great Lakes were full of chub, there's not so much left anymore, yeah, but it's in the yeah. herring family, and it's a really oily, really delicious fish, and he, he just jammed it in my mouth, and I, you know, I think I was maybe seven years old, and that taste memory, I would say, is the one thing that turned me into a chef many years later. Um, so th that, that's a part of my story. Mm -hmm. uh, my, my dad was uh, a workaholic, and my parents ended up getting divorced when I was 13. And for a lot of kids, they're, 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 I don't know what their dads do with them, but for my dad and I, we'd go out to eat. So <laughs> we'd go out and have sushi, and we'd go to different restaurants and try them. And so I think the, the divorce was a big part of... Um, we, we had to, you know, we, it was very awkward. Yeah. Uh, we didn't have a great relationship, but we, we had to do something, so it was usually food. Um, so that that's a big part of it, and then, you know, I wasn't I, I was always very interested in math and science, um, and studied uh, computer science and math in college. Mm -hmm. Where did you go to half, college? Uh, Northern Illinois University. Okay. A Husky, and about halfway through, um, I moved into a house and I started to to bake bread a lot. I've I've always cooked my whole life. My family's cooked and I've enjoyed it. Uh, but I joined an organic food co-op called the Duck Soup Co-op, and. Um, Marx Brothers pun, um, but uh, I remember things like uh, getting a beautiful, a huge cold organic orange uh, and a bag of cashews and peeling the orange and eating the orange and eating the cashews and being like, wow, this is like the best. And I, I still am really drawn to simple, you know, non -co not complicated flavors. Right. Um, but, but kind of bumped up, I think trying, you say. Trying, trying. Yeah. Um, but, I, I, you know, and then, and then when I graduated college, five-year plan, uh, I did a really, really, really good <laughs> job partying um, in college. But when I graduated, um, I worked um, in computer science for a really short time. And uh, I was at work on a Sunday, and my, my boss was kind of mean um, and was getting on my case about uh, something that I was doing a poor job on. And I had a, I had a Volkswagen bus. Uh, she, she yelled at me because I would go sit in my Volkswagen bus and eat my lunch and then take a nap and then go back to work. She thought that was really bizarre. Um, but finally, on a Sunday, I was there on my own accord finishing this program, and she started to yell at me, and I was like, stop. This isn't for me. Thank you. I'm done. And I remember meeting with my dad and saying, Dad, you know what? I think I want to be a chef. I love to cook. I love food. And as my dad would say, he said, I think you're crazy, but I'll support you in anything you do. And I just started working in kitchens. And, you know, I think... My wife gets all the credit for getting me my first cooking job. Where was your first cooking job? Um, it was at a place called Metropolis Cafe at the corner of North and Wells. Anybody, anybody ah, remember Metropolis Cafe? Everything connected from there sort of. I, 
I worked there. Uh, Rick Bayless and his wife Deanne were regular customers there. They'd come there on Mondays to eat. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, when you worked there as a cook, in between lunch and dinner, you would actually wait on the tables. It was, it was a pretty revolutionary restaurant in Chicago, I thought. But I, I really learned how to cook and taste food, not just be a part of the, the service or a part of the operation. It was really cooking food and tasting it and getting excited about it. Um, but I waited on Rick and Deanne. They, they, you know, we became acquaintances. And mm -hmm. next place I went to apply for a job was Frontier Grill in Topolo Bampo. So, yeah, blah, 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 blah. Well, it's interesting because, I, you know, you talked about your dad and the divorce and um, sort of how that led you to have this relationship through food. And um, I, I thought, like, family as a concept seems, like, really important to what you do, not just your own... Biography, although you have your, like your mom's icebox tomatoes <laughs> in here and stuff, yeah. um, which is such a great recipe. But uh, it seems like more like a concept that kind of drives a lot of what you do. Um, you know, our, 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 our restaurant group is um, almost a thousand employees now. Oh, um, Blackbird huge. will be 20, 20 years old, um, December 1st. Um, so that's our 20th anniversary. And um, all, all along for me, um, you know, I, I think I'm a pretty good cook, but I, I, I really get a huge kick out of watching people grow, seeing people grow, teaching them, mentoring them. And so uh, really, I think our, our restaurant group is like a big family, a big happy family. And uh, my whole objective is to create opportunity uh, for people in the kitchens and in the front of the house so that they can um, get where they want to go. Yeah. Um, kind of, I mean, I, I really like to take, take the back and let them get all the credit for everything, even if it was my recipe. <laughs> <laughs> no. Lead from behind, as yeah, they yeah, say. Yeah, exactly. But uh, there's family, too, in the whole like concept of publican as like this kind of convivial, like everybody, not you don't have your own separate table. You might sit at a table where people you don't know are sitting. I mean, I know that's not family, but it feels like it's designed to kind of create, you know, camaraderie and maybe friendship over food. Yeah, you know, the our, our, it's funny because for those of you that haven't dined at Blackbird, the seats are really close together. We got so much flack from that, for that early on. Avec, too. Uh, yeah, but Avec was, um, uh, happened because uh, my wife and I went to Europe. Uh, it was the first time that I'd ever been to Europe. It's a really long story, um, but my wife was in a horrific motorcycle accident in France uh, with a guy she had met. Um, platonic relationship, it's a fact. Um, <laughs> she, she, it's true. Riding around a motorcycle in France and it was a platonic relationship. Does that sound right to you? It was. Um, um, but anyways, they got in a horrific motorcycle accident and she uh, convalesced in a little town in Switzerland where the guy was from called Geis. And it's really literally up in the Swiss Alps, um, about two hours outside of Zurich. And the first time we went to Europe, we, went, we flew into Zurich uh, Mary's friend Franey, who she stayed with when she was convalescing, picked us up at the airport with a bottle of champagne. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. We took the two-hour drive back, drank the bottle of champagne. And as soon as we got to her house up in the mountains, it's a 400-year-old farmhouse. They cook everything in a wood hearth at the house, and it's heated, uh, heated by wood. And so we got there, and we started to cook. And friends started to show up, and we started to drink wine. And this continued for like 12 hours. And at, at times, I would go in the, in the washroom and like fight back the tears from the jet lag. <laughs> but um, that was sort of where this idea of friends and family and, and how important that is to the whole dining experience came to be. Uh, also, I, I, I think back to uh, a, a radio interview that I heard with Alice Waters a long time ago, and mm -hmm. it was really um, a, a huge part of my culinary development. And her, her statement was uh, th that the person sitting across from you is more important than what's on the table in front of you. And to me, food's a, a vehicle to sort of achieve that and to get to know people and to, to have a great time. And, you know, the food is the sole and only focus, and it's all about... Uh, to me, that's a lot, of, a lot of ego, and that's certainly not who I am. Did that work with you and your dad when you were having those awkward conversations <laughs> over... Like, did the food end up opening up something between you? Did you find a way to each other? Um, not so much. Mm. It absolutely did. We our relationship improved so much. No, <laughs> um, no, we, we we had a pretty awkward relationship, my dad and I. But yeah. well, I can't there's lie. Only so much you can do with. I can't lie. Yeah. Well, let's come back to the the idea of the the holy, you know, trifecta um, beer. 
pork and oysters. Yep. So I was thinking, well, beer and pork would be relatively easy to do in the Midwest, but oysters is kind of like a curveball. And then I read that you actually, um, and this gets us into sort of some of the stories that are so important to this cookbook, mm -hmm. um, that you actually created an oyster for publican. <laughs> that would be God that created the oyster. Well, we, we actually planted an sea. oyster in the Duxbury Bay. Yeah. Um, I, I guess, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we, we, we did in the very beginning was try to go directly to the producers. And we set up this network of producers that ship stuff to us. Some is local, a lot is local when it's in season, and a lot is from uh, Monterey Bay, and a lot is from, you know, uh, Stonington, Maine. And uh, we tried to get the greatest ingredients on earth. And like I said, this sort of family restaurant on LSD, like instead of using junky crap, let's use the absolute best product that we can. And that's, mm -hmm. excuse me, sort of been um, my perspective all along. I'm a product guy, you know, I'm a gardener, um, I'm a forager, I love to do all that stuff. And so that's a big part of what we do. And so the opportunity to, we, I was actually at a party in South Beach. <laughs> Come on guys. Um, <laughs> Uh, it was a, a party after a, a cooking event in South Beach, and I had never met. We we ordered a lot of oysters from the Island Creek Oyster Company, and uh, that's a great story in and of itself. The guy that, and we profile him in the book. His name is Skip Bennett, and he was really the first guy that went directly to chefs instead of selling his product to a middleman. So he changed the oyster business for the entire country. Um, normally, you'd grow oysters, they'd go to a, a seafood company, and they'd distribute them. Uh, Skip called up Eric Repair on the phone. Eric picked up the phone in the kitchen, talked to him. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you some oysters. I think you'll like them. And they, they happened to be spectacular oysters that no one had ever planted in this really clean, flat-bottomed uh, bay, Duxbury Bay in Massachusetts. And Eric Repair loved him, and, and the rest was kind of history. Um, I find my, found myself at this party talking to um, some some kids that, that help run the oyster farm. Mm -hmm. And they were like so excited to meet me. They're like, we love everyone that works in your company that we talk to. Everyone's so nice. You guys are awesome. We'd do anything for you. And so that night, I was a little drunk, I'm not going to lie, but I was lying in bed <laughs> and it kept going over and over in my head. We'd do anything for you. We'd do anything for you. <laughs> and so when I saw him the next day, I go, um, think Skip would plant a proprietary oyster for me? We could call it the publican. And they said, well, let us check. And as it turns out, um, there's a peninsula that sort of defines the bay. And on the other side of the bay, the water is much rougher. Um, and Skip had bought these traps. Uh, it's called SEPA gear. And it's, a, it's not the traditional trap that you'd see or the traditional cage that they grow oysters in. These are like cylindrical black plastic baskets that are about 24 inches long, maybe 12 inches in diameter. And... They put the oyster seed in there. They're about the size of a quarter. And the bay is so rough, and they're all strung together. And so as the tide goes in and out and they tumble around in the bay, uh, the, the shell gets broken, and mm -hmm. the shell grows deeper. And so they, they actually, we call them um, the publican oyster. They call them tumblicans um, because <laughs> so the, shell is, the shell is a little bit deeper, and the oyster grows a little bit fatter. Um, and so, so, so that's basically how that happened. And they said, do you guys want to come out and plant the first tumblicans with us and document it and so sort of how the idea for the book started you know I never ever ever wanted to do a cookbook because it really I tried a few times I, I think I tried three times um, and failed each time because I really wanted to be in the kitchen um, cooking and uh, I'm not not a good writer um, so it was kind of a confluence of a lot of things the woman who helped write the book Rachel Dickens Rachel Dickens no. Rachel Holtzman. That's Rachel Dickens. She works for our company. Hi, Rachel. We've been doing a lot of work together lately. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm an idiot. Rachel Holtzman. Um, that's Rachel Dickens, you guys. <laughs> Welcome, um, Rachel. Uh, um, Do you have a beer? <laughs> when, when, when I was, uh, uh, I think it was 99, I, I won the Food and Wine Best New Chef Award and uh, immediately got hooked up with an agent. So you hadn't been cooking that long in 99. I hadn't. Because... Blackbird opened in 98? 97. 97. December 1st, okay. so it was two years. Wow. Yeah, got luck, super lucky. Did that, I mean, you obviously... It ruined, it ruined my life. <laughs> <laughs> Went to your head, right? I'd be You're having like a nice quiet evening like right now if it wasn't... It, it, did, it didn't go to my head, but, but um, no. it, did, it did change things and the expectations got higher. But I, I got hooked up immediately with an agent. Uh, I think it was 
I met Nancy Silverton, and she's like, you know, my agent, Janice Dunnout, really wants to meet you. You know, she loves the restaurant. And mm -hmm. so I signed up. I'm like, yeah, what the heck? Maybe I'll do a cookbook. And 17 years later, and after three <laughs> tries, and she would call me every year, are you ready? Are you ready? And I happened to be um, in a taxi coming, going to the airport, and I just finished a chef event in some city. And, you know, my role has really changed immensely over the 20 years that Blackbird's been open. And uh, people are like, every night, where are you cooking tonight? And I'm like, at my house with my wife, finally, thank you. Um, <laughs> no, um, you're not invited. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you're not invited. But, but um, I, I just thought, yeah, my role has really changed, and I think that the, the, the timing is right, and so decided to do it. I also like that the book cookbook already comes splattered so that you can feel guilt-free at home when you, um, after you buy it and you start making all of this stuff, you don't have to worry about it because most know, of my cookbooks are I really mess. wanted to do um, the cover, a photograph of a blank plate that had like eaten food on it. And it was a great photo and everyone loved it. And it came down to the people that actually buy the books for the stores making the decision. They're like... Um, we don't think we're. We don't think that's going to work. Let's ask the people that are going to actually buy the book, and they all hated it, so I lost. They wanted to look <laughs> at something to eat, not something that had been eaten. Yeah, and I think yeah. the key is that people yeah. don't know that it's blood pasta. But I like the idea that it starts with blood on the cover, <laughs> and then there's blood. Nothing. There's blood in the back. Did you show them that? No, but I. So that same uh, splattered surface. Uh, was a metal, an old metal table that we did a lot of the photography on. And we actually did a lot of it in my garage because the light was really good in my garage. Um, and we splattered blood on it, um, and we thought it was really cool. And so we did this little cheers thing in blood. I just thought it was like table. raspberry coolest or something. I didn't know it was actual blood. How not to sell cookbooks. Yes. Like, I, ain't get, I ain't getting that yes. book. Yes. Um, but I, th I thought it was sort of full circle and very interesting um, and there's only two recipes in the book with blood, so. Well, I want to talk a little bit about, like, home cooking, but uh, just before we get there, I mean, I was really reading this. I was very inspired because there are so many great people across the country growing food or, you know, mm. of all different kinds and doing it in this fantastic way. And I wonder, you know, it really gave me heart because you can – Imagine that everything is processed and wrapped in saran wrap or whatever, and you know there isn't any of this. But um, do you feel like we Americans are that connected to that reality, or are we getting more connected? Do we understand that there really is a lot of terrific food production? Yeah, absolutely. Um, getting way more connected, like mm -hmm. very connected at this point. Like I would say, when I started cooking, which was I think 30, 32, 33 years ago, my first cooking job that. Um, uh, seasonal and local was just a buzzword. And I think, like, Alice Waters had maybe two cookbooks out that sort of, you know, she, she's my hero. She really started the American food, food movement, my seasonal cooking. Mm -hmm. um, and I would go to the farmer's market with my first chef, Erwin Dreschler, and there was no chefs there, zero. Um, it was the Lincoln Park Farmer's Market, and actually the, uh, there was no organic food. The food was, um, there was not a lot of uh, variety um, I mean, it was like yellow squash, zucchini, tomatoes, you know, the same same old crap, not a lot of diversity. And to see where it's gone, um, I, I actually was fortunate about five years ago, um, Alice Waters was in town, and I met her at the Green City Market, and we walked the market, and she said, maybe the most um, diverse market that she's ever seen, just the sheer variety of different things that, you know, Nichols Farm alone is growing is incredible. And so I think I think American cuisine has certainly emerged in the last 20 years. You know, um, people like Charlie Trotter and on and on and on have just forged the way for, um, you know, Alice Waters, Charlie Trotter. Mm -hmm. there, there's a ton of them. And so for me now, um, you know, as a young cook, you'd say, you know, it's all about French food or it's all about Italian food. And I, I think American uh, cuisine has really, you know, a guy like Grant Ackett's has just made such headway and, you know, whether you like it or not, uh, really define the way people cook in this country. And, um, yeah, it's, it's going pretty good right now. We right when I'm about to finish. <laughs> <laughs> You're not finishing. Nah. Uh, you're just getting started. Yeah. So um, you talked about uh, Erwin Dreschler, but I wanted to ask, like, so with your science background, and obviously you're kind of, you like to experiment sure. uh, in all kinds of ways. Did you feel at all drawn to that, like Charlie Trotter, Grant Ackett's, that 
that kind of cooking? Did that ever no. tempt you, lure you? <laughs> Great no. interview. Hell no. no. <laughs> um, you yeah, know, you know, you know. Honestly, I, I think I, I, I go back to that. I'm kind of uh, single-minded, and I go back to that that smoke fish moment and how that that one. There was such soul in that, and I feel like you know, with some of that growth in in cuisine in America, I think there's a lot of misdirection and and really the way that you cook sometimes. You know, the way you braise oxtail or way, the way you braise a lamb shank gets lost, and the, those are. That's where soulfulness comes from and flavor. And um, so I think with that, um, I, I've always been very single-minded and I, I like food that has a ton of depth and a ton of soul. And, um, you know, I always felt like um, at Blackbird, when I cooked in that kitchen every day, that I was kind of a barbarian, you know, but people were like, man, we, we love your food. It's super delicious. And, and then some young guys that work with Grant, you know, David Posey, who um, has a restaurant called Elks and now who worked for me, uh, for a number of years, um, he came, and I think um, if I would be so bold that it was sort of that modern technique that he learned from Grant and sort of the soulfulness uh, that he learned at the kitchen at Blackbird, those two things combined have sort of defined him as a, as a great chef. And so um, I, I, I stick to my guns. You know, I like the way that I eat now is really simple, you know, great product. You know, tonight my wife and I roasted a chicken and sauteed some broccoli and made a nice salad, and that was it. We eat like normal people eat. Um, but, yeah, n never really drawn to a, a lot of bells and whistles. But you're, you're really challenging um, normal people to up normal cooking because this has a lot of, um, you know, like really go homemade, and it, it talks a lot about ways you can integrate homemade things into your repertoire. Sure. So... <laughs> Explain, because it's you know sometimes it feels like a lot of work. I think um, you know you can look at the book and you could be uh, easily daunted by ingredients that we source or by recipes that may have four parts. There's also a lot of recipes that I think are amongst hopefully will be amongst the greatest things you ever cook uh, that are one recipe and the ingredients are easy to find. So it kind of runs the complete gamut, and we kind of talk to the philosophy, you know, in the, in the beginning is the anti-tweezer manifesto. I don't know if you saw that. <laughs> I did see um, the anti- I can't believe you just asked me that question. Have I ever been drawn to that kind of food? And I, I wrote something called the anti-tweezer manifesto. Well, Man, come on. Back in the day, you might have had a moment where you wanted to, okay, the anti-tweezer method. Um, manifesto. Manifesto <laughs> and method. If you take a look in our kitchen, you'll see we're using the tweezers God gave us. Yeah, I don't know if it grosses you guys to out now, too, but that's it. another pet peeve of mine. There, there's going to be no rubber left in the world. In modern kitchens, they go through like four boxes of rubber gloves a day. Just wash your hands and, you know, this is a great spatula, you know, in, in a big bowl using your hand. But I, I've seen young cooks change gloves like five times in five minutes. It's like, man, it's crazy and expensive. Yeah, you should have an anti-glove manifesto. <laughs> yeah. that, that That'll be in the next a, book. Yeah. Um, but, okay, so this is also the page with the public and pantry. Um, so things that we should have at home. Finishing vinegars. Yep. 12-year-aged muscatel grape vinegar. Yep. 25-year-aged sherry vinegar. Any of that stuff that you can find, you could just come to Public and Quality Meats and buy it there. <laughs> okay. Shameless plug. But we have just about all the things that we really rely on in the pantry there. But, you know, it, it doesn't have to be that. It could be any, any good vinegar to add acidity. I mean, the, the, the best ones are good salt and, lemon, and a lemon right. and good olive oil. That, those are, that's, that's the publican pantry. And wine. And wine, Lots correct. Lots of wine. Um, so tell me about, like, the espelette pepper or piment d'espelette. Why did that become the signature ingredient for you? Um, well, I'll, I'll talk about that, and I'll talk about spices in general. Okay. Um, how many of you guys have ever had espelette? Oh, good, good. Uh, I mean, number one, it's it's super duper expensive, but you, it, it's a uh, Appalachian origin control. It's controlled by the French government. Uh, you can buy declassified espelette that's like one quarter of the price, and it's just about every bit as good. Um, but it's uh, uh, the peppers are called espelette. A good a good friend of mine is actually doing the espelette pepper tour right now, uh, going through all the the you know, the, the farms where they grow the peppers, but they dry them in mats in the sun and they, and they grind them up very coarsely. And uh, the, the, the sheer draw is it's not really spicy. It has a little hints of orange and just incredible complexity. And we just found that everything you put it on is delicious. So how, can you, how could you not be drawn to that? So 
And we, we also talk about in the book a guy named Lior Sirkars, who is an Israeli man that I did a lot of consulting wi mm -hmm. work with over the years. And he um, is maybe the only apprentice to a great French chef named Olivier Rollinger, who um, is sort of known as the spice chef. You guys forget about me, I'm boring. Olivier Rollinger um, was a businessman in Saint Malo in France, and he got jumped and nearly beaten to death. And while he was convalescing, that word's coming up a lot today, but while he was convalescing, he decided that he wanted to become a chef. And so he uh, decided to open up a restaurant in the family home and went from a, a small restaurant and years later got his third Michelin star. And he's known as the spice chef, the greatest seafood chef in the world. Um, and after he got his third star, he closed the restaurant. He was the first guy to say, excuse me, but fuck you, Michelin. Um, <laughs> and he closed his restaurant. It also was because his body was really beat up. You know, he's still, his health was not that great. Uh, but now he has a small restaurant called Chateau Bricourt. It's a little, I think, 12-room hotel. Go there in the off-season. It's in Brittany. It's really inexpensive. He cooks the same food, or his chefs cook the same food that they did at the Three Star, some of the greatest food I've ever had. But um, I, my friend Lior hooked me up for a coffee with him in the morning, and he like looked over the horizon, and he started talking about the origins of spice, black pepper, and cinnamon, and all these things, and it was really, really fascinating. Um, and you, you eat his food, and there's like... Uh, a salt made with ground up sea plants and this, that, and the other oh thing. God. But anyways, Le Lior studied with him and learned how he approaches blending spices and opened this shop called Le Bois a Piece in New York. You could order his spices online. Um, and they are the great, you'll become the greatest cook ever. There's one called Ken Kahl. We talk about all this stuff in the book, but Ken Kahl is the biggest oyster port in Europe, in Brittany. And the salt, it's, it's, a, it's a French sea salt that has orange, and fennel pollen and fennel seed. And you, you ask Lior what else is in the blend, and he always says, Paul, do you want my American Express card too? <laughs> he, doesn't tell you, he doesn't tell you everything that's in the blend, uh, but ultimately um, they're really easy to use and they're really delicious, um, and they make you, they're really fun to cook with. Like my wife and I, I'm 55, she's 58. We're making a big effort to cook with less salt. You know, I've been in professional kitchens for you know, 30 years and, you know, the BP's going up. You got you to gotta lay back on the salt. And so we rely really heavily on these spices and uh, th the food's really delicious. We use like half the amount of salt and we, we substitute a great spice blend. You know, he has one called Mishmish, which is uh, mainly, uh, it's uh, saffron and granulated honey and something else. And he tried to emulate the flavor of an apricot in a spice blend. See, he just does crazy stuff, and they're, they're like singular ingredients that are super fun to cook with. He's in here, right? You have a list of he, like a lot of your He purveyors. pays me for these pitches, too. Right. So. <laughs> I would say you should really earned it with that. Um, but so people who get this can find out where to get some of these Yeah, it's all, it's all in the book. And yeah. so, so anyways, to answer your question, um, I think there's a lot of, uh, you know, just, just the story of the public and chicken. We, we, we tried 10 different chickens. Uh, from 10 different farms, maybe that's an exaggeration, a lot of different ones, a lot of different peppers, and we went through the recipe over and over, and Brian Houston, who was the original chef, who kind of, he's from Evanston, but for some reason, I always think he's a southern guy, he talks real slow with kind of a drawl, and he's, he's like, PK, let's just squeeze some lemon juice over that, I think that'll make it better, <laughs> and it was like absolute eureka, uh, it was, it made all the difference in the world, so every public and chicken, every time we serve it, a lemon's cut in half, and they put the lemon in the squeezer. It's not out of a bottle. It's a fresh lemon that we squeeze half of it over the chicken. And it's like, I don't care if it's a steak. I don't care if it's a chicken or fish. Squeeze fresh lemon juice over it. It'll be twice as good. So I guess you don't need to buy the book. <laughs> yeah, just keep talking, and we'll write them down. Um, you, you talked about your blood pressure and um, this guy getting out of the business. Like that it's, it's a, Working in restaurants is really hard. Indeed. Yeah. <laughs> you got to be a little bit crazy to do uh, it. Um, yeah, you know what? I, I think that um, a big part of success for me has been um, a success and failure, uh, empowering people and believing in them. And I'll, I continue to do that. And I continue to, you know, you know, we, our kitchens continue to, you know, uh, help really talented people figure out what they're great at and... Uh, that, that's a big part of it for me because you can't do everything. You know, like I said, we have nine restaurants now, and um, in March next year we'll have 11. And 
Um, just got to really trust people uh, to a fault in my case. And 99% um, of the time, they do incredible things. And um, it, it's great. Um, I think uh, you, got, you do got to be a little bit crazy. Um, I, I call it uh, wrestler mentality. I was, uh, for a large part of my life, I was a grappler. The, the necks, the giveaway, right? <laughs> um, when I go into get a dress shirt, they laugh at me. Um, oh, three X will fit you. <laughs> um, I'm not that fat, but I have a huge neck. Um, but anyways, uh, I remember a wrestling match once, uh, an important one where I went to tie up with the guy and we, we butted heads and I saw stars. And the next thing you know, I was looking up at the lights. Um, I have a lot of great wrestling stories, but, um, <laughs> and, and it was like, uh, you know, in your head, you're thinking, all right, pull it together just get back in it and you know so I'd get my composure and get back in it and I, I don't know if I won that match or lost that match but you know many times in a professional kitchen I'll or in our kitchens I'll say hey I want you to work on this dish with uh, turbo and matsutake mushrooms and blah 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 and blah 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 and I give it to a young cook and they work on the dish and they bring it to me and, it, and in my mind I'm thinking what a mess this is horrible and I, ha I have to be honest with them and say well it really is not where we need to go. It lacks, I try to be gentle, but it really requires thick skin, you know? And for me, that, you know, Rick Bayless and all the chefs that I work with sort of saying, yeah, this is good or it has potential and helping me work through that. So I was more than a cook, they helped me become a chef. Um, I think that's really important and you have to have thick skin or, or that wrestler mentality. Like, you know, you get knocked down, just go right up the stairs again. And, you know, it's, it's hard, you know, we're, we're, uh, and I'm not, don't do the world's smallest violin to me, but you get judged on everything that you do every night by every person that comes in the restaurant. And so that that's, that can be a lot of pressure, and you multiply that by nine restaurants, and that's a lot of yeah. Yelp reviews. Yeah. And uh, yeah, thanks for laughing, you guys, about Yelp reviews. <laughs> oh, the cursed Yelp. I love Yelpers. You do? <laughs> I'm just being totally facetious. No, um, everyone's entitled to their opinion. Well, <laughs> and there are a lot of them out there. Yeah. So um, we, um, you're at a crossroads in a way with um, your, the empire that you're building, and um, it, it reflects a lot of what's going on in Chicago in terms of food in general and craft beer. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just been an explosion of really great um, food and beverage. Tons. But you were talking about like the family atmosphere and all that, and you know, just not long before this program, you had to fire your executive chef, yep. Cosmo Goss, because he mishandled, allegedly mishandled a, an incident of sexual harassment at the, the restaurant, and that must have been a big disappointment for you. Um, yeah, um, heart heartbreaking, kind of earth shattering. Um, you know, um, I think for us, uh, for myself and my partners, um, you know, the safety, health, and well-being of our staff is really job one. Not making a lot of money, not being rich or famous. It really, really is a family. And I think if you walked around the corner to Big Star in, over in Wicker Park and ask any of the 50 people that are working there right now um, if they if they love me, Donnie, and Terry, the, and Peter, the partners that own that, and they would say, yes, we do. And we take a lot of pride in that, and we treat people well. We have the greatest employee parties known to mankind at the end of the year to let everyone know how much we appreciate them. Um, and th that really is job one. So, um, uh, you know, in, in the climate in the world right now, um, we really have to stand tall with zero tolerance. And... Um, it's who we are, and 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 that was really it. And yeah, it was. It, it's really a hard thing. It's still very difficult for me uh, now. I'm I'm not quite myself, to be honest with you. It's uh, on my mind all the time. You know, uh, I think ultimately uh, the decision was made because we we feel that um, we we can't be a crutch for that young man to to figure out what he needs to figure out. Um, I mean, number one, it's our policy, and that's the way we need to run our business. Um, but but ultimately, um, he, he's he's a great fellow, and um, he needs to he needs to learn those lessons on his own, and he will. Um, I, I'm very confident. So, yeah, amongst the hardest things that I've ever been involved with, personally. I mean, it definitely sparked a conversation, and you know, maybe this moment was right for that conversation because there's so much going on um, around sexual harassment and treatment of women at work, and. Uh, 
you know, I just wonder what you thought about that, like this idea that um, it is it is a fairly male dominated space, mm -hmm. um, the world of craft beer and and cooking, uh, and and that there are maybe there there's a sense in which it's a boys club and it can be tough for a woman to operate in that. And I wonder what you've seen. Not I'm not talking just about your restaurants. I mean you in this world and um, watching how people operate, what your sense of that is. I mean, do you feel like I, 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 I think that makes me, and I, I don't know if this answers the question or not, but it makes me think about two things. And one is going back to myself and my career. Um, I, I have never worked in a kitchen uh, that's been misogynist or, I, I've, I've never seen any of that, to be perfectly honest. I'm, I'm looking you right in the eye. I, I've, never, I've never seen that when, when I worked for Rick Bayless that didn't go on in his kitchens. And so, uh, and when I read Anthony Bourdain's book, the, the first book that he came out with, I read the whole book and I was like, this is bullshit. I, I, you know, his, his, it was, what was it, Scott Bryan, the chef that he sort of put up on this pedestal and said, this doesn't go on in his kitchen. You know, they, they work together. Um, it's a team effort. They want to do something great together. And that's the kind of restaurant that I've always been involved with. So, um, do I know that that stuff goes on? Like you, you know, a lot of chefs that I've worked with from New York have this, you know, and I, I hate to pigeonhole it, but it's this like really hardcore, mean culture. You know, there are kitchens where people sabotage other people's mise en place to make make it harder for them. And every time I've heard that, you know, um, Matthias Murgis, who was the chef de cuisine at Charlie Trotter's for 15 years, has a slew of stories that I mean, your jaw would fall to the ground. And um, I was just with him today, and um, he would tell me stories about you know, just screaming and sabotage and just complete mayhem and stuff that you can't even believe. You know, all in the name of food? That seems like the stupidest thing ever. Why, why would, to, to put a good, you know, piece of food on a plate, why would you ever sacrifice uh, somebody's integrity? Or It just doesn't make any sense to me. And so I personally have never worked in one of those kitchens, but um, do I know a lot of chefs? I mean, uh, you, you guys, you know, you read about John Besh in the paper, and uh, I was the best new chef with him in in '99, and uh, I've known John for a long time. I, I, I had no idea; I've never worked in his kitchens, but uh, you do get a different feeling when you're in, you know, kitchens in New York, New Orleans, kitchens in New York. And like I said, I don't know if that answers your question or not, but um, I mean, I guess it's it's, and I know we don't have to spend a lot of time on this, but you know, it's a, when I was asking about like, it's a, it's a horrible life in a way, cause it, it's an all consuming life. And so that, you know, it's not just your work, your day to day being in the kitchen, it's the, all the socializing afterward and all of that. And I wonder if that, just in that atmosphere, it makes it, I mean, I get it that you're in a kitchen, it can be really tough and you get treated badly by a chef, but I mean, more for like women in that space, if that, maybe it just, the lines are kind of unclear. Like where work ends and um, socializing begins. You know that, that that's again. I've never been in that position yeah. because in all the kitchens that I've worked in, um, we we try to work. We we do work as equals. Uh, it, and in most kitchens that I've been in, uh, women have been strong leaders. Um, you know, for me, uh, the first restaurant that I opened, Blackbird. Um, we ended up with this sleek modern space that wasn't what was in my plan, yeah. but I signed up with a business partner. We got this space, and the pastry chef was a, a woman named Shira Harris. And um, Shira really helped me get my footing in that restaurant because she had worked in a fine dining restaurant with uh, food that matched uh, the surroundings. And right. so I relied heavily on her to help me shape what I did there. And there, there were times in that kitchen where out of the five stations on the line, four were women. And to be perfectly honest, those were some of the best teams that we ever had in that kitchen. So I'm not, I'm not, you know, pleading the fifth. Like I'm not, like I don't know what you're talking about. But for for me, um, you know, women have a, a a completely different or a different viewpoint in kitchens than men do. And I think it's essential to uh, to a harmonious group right. in the kitchen. You know, yeah. guys, you know, the chest gets puffed out and they. They're just, they can be jackasses. And so I think uh, in the kitchens that I've been in, um, th that harmony has certainly existed. And it does in most of our kitchens now. 
Well, you mentioned um, Blackbird, but I want to, and I want to ask you about some of the other places. But let's uh, open it up to the audience here for their questions as well. So, um, Josh has got a microphone. If you put your hand in the air, he will bring it to you. Here we go. Um, and if you'd stand up, that'd be great. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, you mentioned your roles changed. You're managing a theme of a team of, th of a thousand people. You're writing a book. Uh, how do you, you know, how do you keep yourself motivated when you're not on the line anymore? You're not cooking as much as you used to. It's a good question. Therapy. No, I don't <laughs> go to therapy, but sometimes I think I need to. Um, you know, I, I guess ultimately, um, you know, the, the story that that reminds me of is um, uh, Bill Montaigne is our, our new chef at, at Nico. Um, Erling uh, Wubauer, we're, we're opening a restaurant together next year. Um, and so he, he's moving on to a, a newer, greater role. We're business partners now. But uh, Bill started, Bill had a little restaurant called Snaggletooth. Um, and he's a great cook. He worked at La Bernadette. And when he started at, at Nico, um, he sort of lacked direction and um, he lacked focus. And there was a lot of things going on. The staff was... Um, piecemeal, you know, it's staffing's, we could talk for hours about how hard it is to get cooks in this city or any city in America right now. Um, if you guys are unemployed, just, just say you're a cook and you'll get a job. But anyways, I, I guess what I'm saying is uh, I, I was in uh, on Saturday at Nico tasting dishes with Bill and I was blown away how delicious they were and how focused they were. And for me, um, I, I, we, I text him, I, I send him pictures, I, I, I give him cookbooks, we cook together, we talk about food continually, and I think I, I, what motivates me is to see uh, someone that starts at point A and then see them get to this point where, and I could see he was beaming, he was so excited, like, we're, we're, we're getting it now, man, we, we love what we're doing, we're excited about the food, and it's amazing to see that transformation and see what it does for the person, see what it does for the food. You know, the same thing happened with our bakery, um, public and quality bread. I don't know if you guys have had our bread. It is, Greg Wade is a, a whole chapter in the book. He is, I'm not exaggerating, maybe the best baker in America. Uh, I'm not saying that because um, it's our place, but uh, Chad Robertson from Tartine Bakery, who is the king of American baking, uh, baked with Greg when our bakery first opened, and him and I had dinner that night, and he pulled me aside and he said, this guy's the real deal. And Greg is the real deal, but the bakery, when we opened it, it was, it was hemorrhaging money. Like, we just did not know what the hell we were doing. We opened restaurants, not bakeries. And we, we put our resources together, and we, we talked to people. You know, I called Nancy Silverton. Hey, Nancy, what, did, what do you pay for flour per pound? She's like, uh, back in the day, 32 cents, 40 cents, 50 cents. I'm like, gosh, we're paying 250 for locally milled organic flour. we got to figure something out. But we, we, we put our heads together, and we turned it around um, 100%. And it's super successful now. The bread is great. The bread is consistent. So it's kind of, it, maybe it brings me back to the, the math and science uh, part of my life, but it's uh, looking at every detail and every variable and trying to figure out what to do to make it work and make it successful. And whether that's little details on one dish or whether that's a really dedicated uh, and motivated and talented cook that uh, has to find his or her place in the kitchen, um, that, that's kind of what motivates me. That's really exciting and uh, gives me a, a huge uh, sense of fulfillment at this point. And of course, the harder I work, the more I get to fish. Hi. Um, I wanted to, I was wondering, with so many different restaurants and with so many different projects that have been so successful, do you find that there's a narrative through line or some sort of connective tissue between all those different projects? Or do they feel like separate kind of explorations of you yourself as a chef? Oh, that's a good question. You know, I think there is definitely a common thread that runs through every kitchen. Um, the, the, I think the way we cook is the same. The, the, the way we source product is the same. Um, uh, re really, each, each restaurant is, um, I don't know if that answers the question. Um, I think I think people like ask, well, why, why, it's, you're crazy. Why, each restaurant's different. Why do you do that? And to be perfectly honest, it's just what we're passionate about. And it's not always me. Sometimes it's my partner Donnie. You know, he's Italian. He just dreamed always of opening an Italian restaurant. Uh, Erling, who was uh, the chef of Avec at the time, uh, dreamed about opening up an Italian seafood restaurant. And uh, we went to Italy, and I got you know 
super crazed about Italian food, and we opened up an Italian seafood restaurant. So I think it's uh, a combination of what we're passionate about and, and ultimately, I, I think the, the, on any given day, I think you could go to restaurants and swap dishes out and no one would be the wiser, even though one may be Mediterranean and one's Italian and one's fine dining. I think there are dishes at each that um, are, are super similar. You know, back in the day, it was really hard for me to distinguish between Blackbird and Avec. Uh, sometimes I'd be like, man, the food at Avec is fancier and better than the food at Black. It, it, there's no rhyme or reason to it, to be perfectly honest, so... Bad answer, sorry. <laughs> That's a good answer. Um, so obviously, One Off has a great list of restaurants. Um, I'm curious about, personally, what are your, some of your favorite spots, uh, restaurants and bars, kind of just rapid fire uh, throughout Chicago? Well, my, my business partner, Terry, and I, one of our ultimate goals in life is to write uh, a book called The Ten Greatest Bars on Earth. And we only have like two, uh, but we, we, we love the Rainbow Club. I don't know if you've ever been to the Rainbow. It's right near here, but spent a lot of time at the Rainbow Club. Um, I like uh, Chicago Kalbi is one of my favorite restaurants, the Korean barbecue restaurant on Montrose. You ever been there? Super good food. Uh, it's a husband and wife. Um, one of them is Japanese, I believe, and one's Korean, uh, but they're, they are the sweetest people ever in the history of the world, and their hospitality is... Um, just exudes from every pore in their body. So not only do you go there and the food is delicious, and I, it's where I go when like a group of chefs are in town. Like I took Fergus Hend Henderson from London there, and they do this uh, mountain chain, this braised third stomach cow tripe. It's not all like that. It's delicious, simple food. But they just went crazy over everything that they ate there. So Chicago Colby's a favorite. Um, I know it's one of our places, but um, I said earlier that Big Star for me is like Ferris Bueller. It's like everybody loves Big Star, Sportos, Geeks, and Motorheads. I love that line from Ferris Bueller's Day Off. But I just, I, I love going there. It like makes me smile. It's really fun, and the food's pretty good, and the drink's pretty good, and um, I like Big Star a lot. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a really hard question. Um, I, I, I love uh, David Posey and Anna's restaurant, Elksa. I think it's really special and clean and delicious. Um, the, it, there's so many great restaurants in the city. It's I, I haven't even tried a lot of them at this point. Other questions? Rapid fire. Uh, I love Doves. Yeah, that's that's a good call. Doves is Doves is good. It's a special place. Have you had the Samita there? Yes. Oh my God. You know Doves is. You know what? You know how Doves was born? No. How? Doves was born because did you ever go to Leo's lunchroom? Yes. Anybody go to Leo's Lunchroom? Yeah, what a place that was. It was on Division. It was like a rock and roll place. Uh, they played cassette tapes, had postcards up. Food was really good. And then, of course, you, if you went to Leo's, you went to the Busy Bee, which was where Bill Kim's restaurant is now. And we, all of myself and my partners, loved those two places. And when they disappeared from the neighborhood, we, we, we felt like, man, we want to do something that you know, is a sort of a community gathering place, really chill, plays great music, and we had to share a kitchen with Big Star, so had to be Latin-inspired food. So that's the complicated equation as to how we came up with Doves. It's great. I mean, you can be there with a bunch of people or by yourself. Sorry. Hi. That's okay. Um, so along the same lines, all the other restaurants kind of have that theme of, like, being, you know, together and all together. Violet Hour is a little different. Um, can you explain kind of where Violet Hour came from? It's actually very different. You know, it's darker, and you're kind of sitting here. Yeah, you know, the, 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 they kind of. They, I'll, I'll explain it, but I, I'll also tell the story of that when my partners Donnie and Terry opened that, they came to me and they said, "Do you want to do the food there? Uh, we don't want it to be good." And I said, "Hmm, no, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me. I mean, obviously, they wanted it to be about the cocktails." Um, and so, and then as we do in our company, they said, um, okay, well, we'll give you 5% ownership anyways. And that's just to keep us all united as a team and excited about everything. And I'm, I'm at most a shot and a beer guy. I'm not a cocktail guy. But the way the story works is um, my partners uh, really, I think, have their, their uh, hands on the pulse of what's going on in the restaurant and beverage world in this country. And they were both obsessed with a place called Milk and Honey um, in New York, which was, I think, 
maybe the first of the craft cocktail revival places. How many of you guys have, had been to Milk and Honey in New York? Pretty amazing little spot. I mean, it was like in an old tailor shop, no sign. You just went in there and it was like, you know, there's a, a, a bar in the center with a block of ice and they would chip the ice, just as, as old school as it gets. And they were completely obsessed with that. And there was a young uh, bartender at uh, Milk and Honey named Toby Maloney. And Toby and his um, partner Jason started a company called Alchemy. Uh, but that came after they partnered up with Donnie and Terry and opened the Violet Hours. So Donnie and Terry approached those guys and said, hey, man, we want to do that in Chicago. And Terry had been through a series of um, uh, challenges with that spot. I don't know if you guys remember the history of that, that restaurant. It was... I was just talking about Mod today. It was Mod, which and was a great restaurant. But yeah. um, they had some problems with people. And, and before that, it was... Uh, Del Toro came before Violet Hour, right? Yeah, Del Toro. Anyways, uh, and, and that was finally the, the sticking point. Um, and, you know, it's been going strong ever since. It's like a machine. It does the same business every week. It just goes and goes. And, you know, Toby comes four times a year and completely redoes the with Eden, who runs the, the who's a partner there and, and, and runs the cocktail program. They redo all the drinks together. And um, I think, you know, I only own five percent, so if I could be so bold, I think they really started the, the 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 craft cocktail movement in Chicago. And if you look at the family tree of all the cocktail places, that's really where it started. Like, just about everyone started there, and um, it's a pretty special place if you like cocktails. <laughs> no, no, I'm just joking. I'm in such trouble. I no, read an I, interview I like where you drank a Sazerac, so you do occasionally. I do, I do like Sazerac. Or was that just for the that, interview? That's, that's how complicated it gets right. for me. I really like Sazeracs. Right. Um, you know, just, and we have to wrap it up, but so you, you know, you have like, what, four restaurants in this general area, mm -hmm. um, Big Star, Publican Anchor, Doves, and Violet Hour. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, we were talking earlier about... 3.5. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we were talking about West Loop and how much it's changed. Because when, when Blackbird first opened, that was like that first wave of West Loop becoming a restaurant destination. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it was pretty exciting. But you look at it now, it's like <laughs> it's like Las Vegas. It's like <laughs> close to hell. Yeah. <laughs> so do you think that um, we have too many restaurants concentrated in certain parts of the city and we should, like like, you bringing some stuff here and... You know, obviously, some of the places you like to go are in other neighborhoods. Put Parachute on your list. Parachute. Yeah, that's my yeah, neighborhood. That's, that's a really good one. Great restaurant. Um, what do you think about that? Like, trying to get more out into the neighborhoods, or you think we're doing fine? I mean, of course, that, that would be great. Um, it would spread our city out a little bit, but I, I certainly understand the convenience of the West Loop. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, my partner, Donnie, and I were strolling along Fulton when there was nothing there. And the, the guy was digging out the basement of the building that the publican's in now. And we said, hey, man, can we get a space in this building? And he's like, yeah, in about three years. And, you know, when we were looking, we just thought everything is right about this spot. You know, right off the expressway, close to downtown, close, it's close to everything. Um, it's so congested now, it's insane, especially with all the construction. I think there's like five hotels uh, that are going up there. One that we were going to do, but we didn't get the... The deal we lost out to, to the Boca team, which is a good thing because I didn't want to do the hotel anyways. <laughs> <laughs> is this a comment really? about Nico, or is it just no? You know what? Uh, a whole different thing being in a hotel. You know what? Um, we we really try really hard with Nico to to be a freestanding restaurant within a hotel, yeah. and that that has a ton of challenges that come along with it. And of course, um, everything that one restaurant could do—breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, banquets, catering, room service, we do it all. And we do it all with a, a grin on our face, a shit-eaten grin on our face. Um, <laughs> I, I wouldn't, um, like I said, it's it's a challenge. And so I think we've, we've done our, our hotel, I, I hope. You never know, my, my partner will come to me like, yeah, we got this great opportunity to do this hotel. And the next thing you know, I'm doing a hotel. But um, for now, I think one's enough. But uh, to answer your question... Um, I am running away from the West Loop at 100 miles an hour. But the, the first kitchen that I worked in, we would do something called a freedom run. There was a screen door on the back door, and I would just look at one of my 
my friends that was on the line, and we would just burst out the back door and run down the alley as fast as as fast and hard as we can and scream, and that was our freedom run. And so sometimes I feel like that, like I feel that we would also primal scream in the walk-in. You know, you were asking how you deal with the stress. We just go in the walk-in and just scream, scream our heads off. Um, but. Um, there's a lot of great restaurants in the West Loop, a lot of great restaurants. Um, so I, I, I don't want to badmouth it because, you know, a bunch of them are ours. Um, but, but, at the, but at this point, the congestion is completely over the top. Um, you know, every day there's a different street blocked off because there's a giant crane putting up a huge building. And, you know, I, I, my, my, dad, my dad had a fish factory in that neighborhood. Well, I was going to say, the irony is that that was the neighborhood that kind of supplied all the restaurants. And it now was. that whole economy has been displaced by restaurants. Yeah, my, my dad had to keep, uh, we had grown up, we had uh, a couple of Alaskan Malamutes, huge dogs. He had to bring them to work and keep them in the office of the fish factory every day so that he could walk from the car, from the office to his car because the neighborhood was so rough. And it was crazy brutal. The first publican sweatshirts on the back, it said no lumping. How many of you guys know what lumping is? Well, that neighborhood was where all the product would come in, and these uh, uh, transient guys would, the guys that ride on the side of the, the semis and tell the semi drivers where to go and help them unload, those are lumpers. A little Chicago history for you. Oh. And there were signs on the, on the Fulton Market that said no lumping, but not anymore. Anyway, sorry, you guys. No, you <laughs> please. It's a pleasure talking with you. you. You should be like Paul, Mr. Chicago Khan. You know... So that's much about this city. That's me, all right. That's you, all right. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you so much. This is a really great book. Great Thanks, reading. you guys. Great recipes. Thanks for coming.